Okay, so uh, today I'm going to hopefully have some philosophy fun with you. Uh, and I hopefully will, by the end of this, have explained to you everything to do with my title, Philocles Becomes a Lover, The Sublimer's Philosophical Practice in Shaftesbury's The Moralist. So to begin, um, what are my actual aims here? So uh, primarily is to present a plausible account of Shaftesbury's sublime as a philosophical practice. Uh, I hope it's plausible by the end. Because of uh, the world being a bit as it is and uh, the nature of not being able to think about stuff very much, I haven't really thought about this material for quite some time. So the last time I thought about it was when I was potentially going to give this talk a while ago when circumstances prevailed that I couldn't. So in a sense, uh, the level of plausibility might not be as compelling as if I was working on this every day. So I'm uh, warning you in advance that this is an attempt to reconnect with it. And I'm hoping uh, that together we can have some thoughts about this in a way that not only helps me reconnect with this material that I haven't had a chance to work on, but also gives you some food for thought. So my approach in giving this uh, attempted at a plausible account uh, is to combine elements of Shaftesbury that are typically treated separately or as separable. So that is primarily uh, his uh, aesthetic theory. So ideas of the sublime being an aesthetic concept and an aesthetic experience that historians of aesthetics talk about uh, and his moral method or his moral philosophy, which is often associated with certain types of uh, stoic uh, practices, but also more broadly just as a uh, cultivation of some kind of moral sense. So my final aim for today, as I was alluding to earlier, is to have some philosophy fun and do it Shaftesbury style. So uh, to add to my earlier warning of this is a moment of me reconnecting with ideas, this is also me um, in the midst of just having finished my grading and a whole heap of other work, uh, producing a new set of slides that are appropriate and having not rehearsed and just going to, in the style of Shaftesbury, have a dialogue with the things that I've uh, presented here. So it's a bit unrehearsed. It will be a bit rough, but my real um, uh, hope of being with you is not so much the talk I give, but the conversation that we have afterwards, which is the most important part of this to me. Um, so I look forward to having a conversation with you about what I have to say here. So what do I have to say? So uh, to begin, I actually want to connect with or have you uh, think about what you already know about the history of aesthetics and that familiar story. I'm sure this is familiar to all of the aestheticians in the room uh, and even to the broader philosophers will have some sense of this story. And I'm going to tell you the story of the history of aesthetics as historians of aesthetics give it in order to uh, show in a sense how I'm going to push against elements of that or offer a new perspective in relationship to that uh, such that uh, it's seen as uh, a broadening of Shaftesbury, not an ignorance or, or a um, rejection of what we take to be sort of the familiar understanding of the history of aesthetics. Um, so to begin, uh, I'm going to go backwards in time. I think that's the most helpful sort of way uh, to understand uh, both Shaftesbury's existing location in the history of aesthetics, but also how I might be pushing against the broader story or opening up the broader story to understand the sublime in particular as more than just 
a particular part of the history of aesthetics uh, as this story suggests. So starting with Kant and the critique of the power of judgment in 1790, we get the three main things out of the history of aesthetics, out of 18th century history of aesthetics with regard to the aesthetic beauty and the sublime that were perhaps most familiar as uh, aestheticians now and uh, most uh, representative of what we take from the history of uh, aesthetics, but also to what uh, we uh, in, continue to engage with in contemporary aesthetics. So uh, I've been a bit cheeky in how I've presented all these. I've done them in a slightly pejorative sense. So I've treated Kant very technically. So Kant's aesthetic is uh, the pure subjective judgment of an indeterminate concept's form of purposiveness that is universally valid. Um, and basically <laughs> what we get from Kant is, is this uh, strong sense in aesthetics of uh, some kind of uh, concept of the aesthetic being a subjective ju judgment um, that is one that we all ought to have about an object when we point at it and say, that is beautiful. We expect everyone to just uh, uh, in virtue of our nature as subjective judges, uh, agree or assent to, to that judgment. Um, and the indeterminate concept is the element that distinguishes it from the types of judgments that we might want to generally call in a perhaps a quite a flat footed way, um, like uh, scientific or empirical disputable judgments that connect with the nature of the world rather than the nature of our, our subjective uh, experience. And uh, importantly, the aesthetic uh, with Kant is understood as some kind of disinterested pleasure of form where beauty, where we move to beauty, is the harmonious pleasure of form through the three, free play of the faculties. So beauty itself, as opposed to the judgment of beauty, is uh, a psychological, subjective um, experience that elicits pleasure. And it has to be in relationship to the form of, of things. And then uh, finally, the sublime in Kant is understood as a similar aesthetic pleasure, but it's associated in this um, sense with uh, threatening nature. And the sublime accounts are the most significant to ours today because we're going to be talking about Shaftesbury's sublime. So uh, the full-blown account of the sublime that comes out of the 18th century is uh, strongly associated with Kant. And it's these two uh, types of the sublime where you're having this pleasurable emotion, this uplift transporting response to something that we ought to, under certain circumstances, we ought not to be able to either find pleasurable or have that type of experience. So in the case of, or the paradigm case of crashing oceans, which is the dynamical sublime for Kant, it's, it's where we have a safe experience of something that would be uh, quite, um, if we were in the ocean, we, we wouldn't be having pleasure at the terror, but we can have this pleasure at a distance. And then um, the mathematical sublime for Kant is uh, the pleasure at comprehending uh, the infinite. So, so it's comprehending the incomprehensible. And the paradigm example of that is mountain ranges or mountains where we, can't, we get pleasure out of imagining it as the whole, even though we can only perceive parts of it at a time. So either the peak of the mountain or the base of the mountain we can't like, uh, and that's to mirror the infinite in the experience of, um, like that's a analog to experiencing the infinite, which our finite minds actually don't have the capacity to properly comprehend. 
So that's the part, like sort of the sublime that we're probably most familiar with coming from Kant. And that has uh, its origins uh, primarily in Burke. So I'm going to sidestep Hume in this story and go straight to Burke, uh, who paralleled uh, Hume at the time and a philosophical inquiry into the origin of the sublime and the beautiful, which is out of 1757. And for Burke, uh, he is putting forward a sense of the aesthetic as an empirical theory of taste, which is based on the passions. And that's uh, very similar to Hume and uh, Burke and Hume are in conversation about that at the time. And for Burke, he considers beauty to be, uh, in a sense, a love for the things or the passion for the things um, that we love and it's a social quality and importantly uh, there's some strong associations with the type of love we would have the paradigm case being the opposite sex so uh, being a masculine like a, a, a male perspective this the opposite sex means women so beauty is often diminutive and has these certain connotations which are which uh, we perhaps wouldn't want to see in a theory uh, now, but that uh, brings us to the sense of how the sublime is in contrast to it in that like the emotional response is sort of this uh, strong but, but not powerful transport, which is uh, reserved for the sublime, which he describes as a terrible delight and anticipates Kant, Kant's account of that, that um, response uh, that subjective response of feeling safety at a distance. And importantly, this is associated with a terrible delight in nature and physical nature. And uh, so concentrating on that response to physical nature, Addison offers us a uh, early or anticipatory aesthetic understanding with regard to the grand and that uh, is associated or more broadly understood as his aesthetic as taste as being pleasure of the imagination uh, which is associated with this notion of novelty of receiving surprise that like things that sort of like catch our eye um, and bring us imagination uh, bring us pleasure through illuminating the imagination and in that particular sense, Addison separates out uh, beauty as objects that strike the soul. Again, they're the opposite sex, but also he describes things that are colourful and, and sort of um, bright out in the world. And as I mentioned earlier, then the sublime is uh, the grand objects of nature. So those anything that brings on a feeling of astonishment. So the takeaways from this familiar story is uh, importantly for these accounts, there's a separation of beauty and the sublime. And uh, the sublime here is understood as a response to physical nature. And uh, there's an element, so the idea of astonishment uh, also anticipates the idea of terror that the sublime is associated primarily and is understood, and this is the familiar story that we're interested, that historians of aesthetics are interested in, is that the sublime is um, a response to uh, that kind of Burkean terrible delight and that it's in contrast to beauty that it, it that that doesn't have the terror in order to to have the delight so I just want to highlight that as sort of the elements of that account that um when I present Shaftesbury in a moment uh start uh to be a bit different in him. So, so my brain will engage with what I mean by that when I look at the next slide. Okay, so 
The important part of this story of the history of aesthetics is that uh, most historians of aesthetics, so people like uh, uh, Paul Geyer or uh, Dabney Townsend or um, there's someone on the tip of my tongue that I just can't remember right now, when they're describing the history of aesthetics, uh, there's either two people they go to to say that uh, prior to Baumgarten's establishment of the aesthetic as a um, defined field, there is uh, this anticipatory story of um, either Addison or Shaftesbury establishing what is understood as, as some kind of disinterested separate sorry disinterestedness as a defining feature of establishing aesthetics as an autonomous field of philosophical inquiry so when you're talking to his uh, when historians of aesthetics are talking about someone like Shaftesbury that's what they pick up so when I have that aesthetic for Shaftesbury is disinterestedness that is definitely the case and what's um, salient then to the history of aesthetics, as the familiar story goes, is that it establishes aesthetics as an autonomous field of philosophical inquiry. So to locate me in relationship to that is I wholeheartedly want us to think about disinterestedness, but I want us in this talk to be open-minded to what is the role of Shaftesbury's discussion of uh, the aesthetic or things that we are describing as aesthetic that aren't focused on establishing that field of philosophical, like field of aesthetics, but rather just what role does it play in philosophy for Shaftesbury? So further engaging with how Shaftesbury is, uh, the familiar story for Shaftesbury with regard to beauty, I'm sure you are familiar with his orders of beauty and importantly, how uh, those orders are associated with the forming forms. So the infinite forming form is God's divine mind. Uh, the forming form is human minds and the dead forms are natural or art objects. And beauty is usually understood as some kind of internal sense. So we have this sense of beauty that uh, has with cultivation the capacity to experience the forms. And then in contrast to that, the sublime is considered to be some kind of um, rhapsodic experience. And in the literature on the sublime, uh, often this is picked out as the first time that the term sublime that comes out of uh, the rhetorical tradition of the sublime style is first being applied to nature. So that gives us a reason for understanding why Shaftesbury is often regularly considered uh, to be sort of this origin account of the sublime that goes off and then becomes Kant's account. So I'm not going to challenge that bit. I think that's right. But what I'm now going to do is think about how that rhapsodic experience, the account of the sublime, uh, is actually what's going on with that in his broader philosophy. So I know we're aestheticians and this is the Scottish Aesthetic Forum, uh, but I'm hoping that you'll grant me the uh, latitude to, to talk more broadly about the sublime as uh, a philosophical practice. So what is Shaftesbury's uh, philosophical practice? So as I mentioned earlier, these are understood, uh, like the aesthetic and the philosophical practice are understood separately. So before I get to how they come together, I'll give us a sense of what Shaftesbury's um, philosophical practice actually looks like. And so for Shaftesbury, uh, philosophy is practice is in a sense appealing to that ancient sense of how to live. Um, and he considers that all philosophy is 
uh, moral philosophy in the sense that he feels that we philosophy needs to work out how to live before it works out the 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 appeal to natural philosophy in that sense of metaphysics being fundamental and this is in conversation with the philosophy of the time so he's uh engaging with and pushing against the approach of like Descartes but also uh the empiricist so Locke in particular and uh for Shaftesbury moral theory is uh to develop the internal moral sense to be good. And Shaftesbury considers his sense of good to be a teleological one. It is um, each human's, it, it's develop, what makes a good human is one that fulfills your purpose. And he does have a metaphysics, even though uh, it's often criticized or suggested that it, it's, it's nonsensical. Uh, this does fit with his sense of the world being this harmo harmonious, organic, cooperative system. And so uh, in, a in, the, in the most universal sense, he suggests that there is no moral good or bad, there's just the universe, uh, but ultimately, but in our microcosm, in our day-to-day, -day, what makes us good is what, what leads to us fulfilling our purpose in this broader system so that's within society within people to people but also in the broader natural world of like um, being a human that exists so in that sense he doesn't think that humans can have any type of objective view of the world we are inherently partial we can only see our place in relation to other parts of the system and again that in a broader sense is critical of of natural philosophy that is assuming that you can observe so empiricism that you can observe the world outside of the system and watch things without understanding yourself as part of it so the moral theory is often really understood in uh, as sort of what when Shaftesbury's doing um, philosophy in this sense. And uh, the aesthetic is considered autonomous from this, or at least the start of an autonomous theory for the aestheticians, uh, because that moral sense and uh, sense of beauty can, can be distinguished. Um, and that's my brain doing Shaftesbury things because I did an interlude that wasn't really relevant at that moment. So if we think about moral theory, so I'll get myself back on track. If we think about moral theory, uh, what it means in a practical sense is the cultivation of the passions where virtue is the appropriate motivated affections, where affections means, some, means feelings directed at something. Uh, and that in general or in broader terms for Shastri means that we have the right sort of passion directed at the right sort of object. So in the most basic sense, uh, we have the right feeling when we're doing the right thing. And although we have this moral sense, which is given and is innate, in order to become our our good selves to become the philosophical stage, uh, Shaftesbury appeals to three ways of cultivating our moral sense. So the first way is uh, soliloquy, and you may be familiar with this in the sense that it's often talked about uh, Shaftesbury's engagement with Stoic exercises. And uh, the exercises themselves are a private practice of self-dialogue in order to develop our judgments. So, in a sense, it's almost like just keeping a diary or, or a journal and doing self-questioning. It's like, why did I, like writing down what you did and then asking why you did that and, and engaging in that way. The second way that Shastri describes uh, philosophical practice and the cultivation of our moral sense is through dialogue. So that's both uh, dialogue 
uh, as a social activity, talking to people, but also using dialogue as a mode of philosophical conversation and communication. And this goes against the idea of producing uh, philosophical treaties and appealing back to ancient uh, dialogues themselves. And he argues that uh, dialogue is central to accessing and conveying genuine knowledge and good sense because it actually reflects the human mind. So he suggests that our cognitive processes don't work in straight lines. And as I'm demonstrating you to you today, mine are definitely not working in straight lines at all at the moment. And he suggests that in virtue of our position as partial participants in relation to the uh, all the other things and people in uh, the universe, we can only have this partial view. And as we know from our experience, our minds don't work in straight lines. And what dialogue does is reflect both that part of the human cognitive process, but also to it allows us uh, to engage and re-engage in ideas that if we discuss them in a straight line, we don't necessarily get to uh, develop in the right ways. So it presupposes that we have like this external objective view that we don't have and that we ought to be able to just get everything in a straight line. But he suggests that's just not how brains work. That's just not how humans work or human minds work. And so therefore uh, we should engage in dialogue. And then the third way, which you probably haven't uh, seen before, uh, and if you have, I think that's awesome because that will give me grist to my mill. There's at least one other person in the world who considers this a philosophical practice. Um, is that the sublime experience that Shaftesbury uh, describes is actually a fundamental philosophical practice and is required along with these two other ways of soliloquy and dialogue. So to get a handle on uh, why the sublime is a philosophical practice, we need to see uh, what's going on in the moralist and where the sublime actually turns up in that account. So the moralist, uh, a philosophical rhapsody, and there are even more words that go to the title of uh, the work, is Shaftesbury's philosophical dialogue. So consistent with his idea of like, we need to like engage in the world in different ways. He doesn't think that dialogue is the only way of communicating philosophy. He writes in all sorts of ways uh, and uses all sorts of literary styles in order to um, convey his ideas. But his, his sort of his main seminal piece is the moralist. And uh, perhaps unusually, I suggest I, I want to suggest to you that a good way to read the moralist in order to get the most out of it is to understand it as it being deeply demonstrative. So it's a demonstration of how dialogue ought to work, how our it's a description of our philosophical practice in this whole hearted sense. And he uses the metaphor of moral painting where the idea is you build up the picture of what morality is by layering on paint and scraping bits away and, and concentrating on certain parts, but then uh, building up a picture over time and coming back and contemplating it and, and engaging with the layers of it. Um, like you would a physical painting. And uh, in relationship to that type of demonstration, he's being deeply demonstrative that in, in a way that it's uh, useful to be read as a guide to moral cultivation. So Shaftesbury is often criticised in The Moralist for uh, offering uh, deeply rhetorical <laughs> 
questions and uh, not seeming to answer them, but there's a sense in which the rhetoric is asking the reader to try to answer those questions for themselves. So in that sense, it's not only a demonstration, here's something to imitate, but as you're reading along, there's a sense in which uh, the rhetorical features are in conversation with the reader as much as the characters being in conversation uh, with each other. So in that, that's uh, relevant to what I'm talking about here is that when I start to quote Shaftesbury and uh, when I appeal to certain parts of the text and it seems very literary, I want us to uh, charitably read it in this sense of like, well, it's supposed to, in a sense, uh, be motivating and eliciting the types of right passions in order us to develop right action. So, so it's meant to develop and motivate us in these ways. So in The Moralist, Shaftesbury's general aim is to reinstate true enthusiasm as uh, the proper philosophical affection. So if we're going to have moral sense and we're going to be affected in the right way and have the right affections, uh, we the one that we want to pick out is enthusiasm. So at that time, enthusiasm is a difficult term. It's a pejorative term. It applies to religious enthusiasts who are often, and it's often associated with melancholia. So there's a sense in which you don't want to be an enthusiast because it leads to a type of madness. But Shaftesbury wants to rehabilitate the term and uh, there's other people at the time that are doing this as well. And that's why he's uh, interested in the true uh, rather than the false. Uh, and he's doing this whilst also at the same time trying to subvert Peronian scepticism of uh, questioning things in the way uh, that Again, this is picking up things to do with uh, natural philosophy and the prevailing empiricism, but also a social, uh, like uh, as we'll see when I move to Philocles now, that there's sort of a fashion towards being uh, a skeptic of sorts. And that's what uh, Shaftesbury is talking to. So the moralist is, uh, a dialogue that's narrated by uh, Philocles and it uh, in the course of many sections and parts uh, describes Philocles' time with the philosophical sage Theocles and in the fashion of uh, ancient like think platonic dialogue uh, he is uh, the, uh, he, Philocles just doesn't retell the story. He's telling this to the philosophical stage, Palamon. So we're getting uh, this an after the fact, remembering and a uh, story being told to someone. And it's a description of several days of experiences. So it's important to understand uh, who Philocles is because what we see in the course of the moralist is Philocles' uh, conversion or becoming uh, a moving towards the type of philosopher that Shaftesbury thinks we all ought to be. So he's what's described as a moderate skeptic, uh, which is an indifferent lover. And the indifference here uh, picks out the idea that uh, there's someone who moderates their passions. So you're not being led by passion. You regulate yourself that you're not too passionate. Uh, and that's that idea that like uh, you, separating rationality from passionate or emotional response. And so uh, that makes him indifferent as, as uh, philosophically lover. Um, and he's also one of those fashionable, 
gentleman who bemoans philosophy. So he's a skeptical questioner of everything. And that, according to Shaftesbury, uh, is a is a fashionable position of men of gentlemen of society. And that's who Shaftesbury is part of and is talking to. But after a few days with Theocles, the philosophical sage, uh, Philocles becomes, or is at least on his way to becoming a philosophical lover. And that's the narrative. And what is relevant to us thinking about the sublime and the role of the sublime as a philosophical uh, practice is that the sublime is the final stage of his education and that is where he gets to experience or observe the experience of philosophical enthusiasm which in the true sense is a sense of loving beauty and coming to know true divine nature. So we see we get a glimpse here of how Shaftesbury considers love of beauty uh, to be integral to the sublime. So beauty and sublime aren't separated on this account. And we also see that it's associated with knowledge uh, and, and coming to know. So we see how Shaftesbury, uh, I'm, I'm alluding to or giving you an initial taste of how Shaftesbury thinks that these three things are all, all working together. And why won't my, sorry, my screens. Everything's frozen on me. Just going to hopefully get something to escape. Okay. I'm hoping I can, ah! Yay, things have unfrozen. So uh, the moment we're introduced to the sublime as a practice is toward, uh, is at a point where Philocles and Theocles have organized to one morning after their days of talking and engaging in philosophical dialogue and guided soliloquy to go and meet in the woods for what is described uh, as the most philosophical experience. And in that experience, Theocles is described as, as having a fit in the sense of uh, being overtaken and uh, transported. So the aim of uh, going into the uh, forest into the woods uh, is to have what is described as to find our sovereign genius if we can charm the genius of place to inspire us with a truer song of nature teach us some celestial hymn and make us feel divinity present in these solemn places of retreat so in that description, we see how uh, the aim is to find the sovereign genius, where that means to experience the imminent mind of God. Uh, and there's this appeal to genius of place, which is an ancient idea of inspiration. So the genii loci are the, the local gods that exist in uh, nature and, and could come out and, and in effect inhabit and transport you and inspire you. So it's a sense of engaging with the muses. And uh, the truest song of nature appeals to the idea of uh, the, the form, the natural form, uh, what uh, again, bringing us back to the mind of God, and uh, it picks out that wherever we're doing this, it needs to be the right type of location. And for Shaftesbury, as told in uh, on his behalf by Theo Theocles, is, is uh, woodlands and forests and um, fields is commonly 
described here. And then the second quote comes immediately after the experience. So, so the first quote is them going off to find it. Then the next quote is having uh, Theocles describe his fit uh, out loud, like his, his transports. He, he comes out of the state and says to Philocles, now Philocles, inform me, how have I appeared to you in my fit? Seemed it a sensible kind of madness, like the transports which we are permitted to our poets. So that's the true sublime. And the one that is related to the literary critical tradition that, that he's uh, taking from the transport of poetry to be the transport within physical uh, nature. Or was it downright raving? So that gives us a sense of like, there's a worry that we could be engaging in this false sublime. So, so that's the part of the text where this is best described with some parts in the middle that very beautifully describe parts of that experience. Um, so I want to give you a sense now of just looking closely at each of those features and then uh, thinking about then what's the outcome of this. So the features of the experience, as we, as I've alluded to already, or gave you a sort of, uh, as I was reading account, is number one is the most important thing is, uh, or defining thing is that you need to go to the right locations. So Shaftesbury appeals to fields and woods in particular. And uh, the thing about fields and woods is that's where we can most easily access divine inspiration as it is imminent in the world. So he thinks that um, sort of in society, so around other people and in the like cities and physical circumstance, we just can't as easily access it as when you go out into the woods. And this is uh, appealing to sort of like and that quite intuitive thing we have where, where it's sort of like, we do make that separation of, of city feeling um, and then uh, out in nature feeling and sort of a shift in how we feel and, and we sort of feel open to the world in a different way. So that's, what, that's the same sort of appeal to location that's going on here. The second thing that's uh, important to this, and in contrast to uh, his other practices, is this is a is solitude. That this is something you do on your own, and it is a particular and unlike the soliloquy, the the private practice which is where you privately do dialogue, this is a different kind of state. So there's no dialogue going on. You're contemplating the world and you're in a state of meditation or contemplation. And contemplation is perhaps a better word uh, for us to use now because meditation often, like we, we, we have had uh, a, a good 10 years of mindfulness being beaten at us that that it's some not that doesn't quite pick out what's going on here for Shaftesbury or we can't reduce it down to to sort of like contemporary senses of of meditation uh there are parallels with uh the Buddhist tradition in if you want to take it in that serious full-blown sense of what what contemplation is doing but um or what med the word meditation is doing but contemplation like it's just going out and and paying attention to the world and uh again what's particular about the sublime in this case is that it's a particular state of mind so importantly it is signified for Shaftesbury as harmony of thought. Uh, and it's harmony of thought which uh, mirrors and allows us direct access to the order of things. So if we live in a universe that is ordered and uh, made by the ordered mind of 
uh, the forming form, the infinite forming form, the mind of God, and our goodness is being in harmony by working to our purpose within that world, then uh, in order to directly experience that, we need to be in this harmonious state. So uh, he describes the experience, the nature of that. It's a f like it's that feeling of where all is lost in the boundless, unsearchable impenetrable so so it's like where we feel like we are indistinguishable from the uh divine itself where we aren't standing in relation to to our experience but we're deeply in it and that as estheticians we would recognize as being uh something common that that sort of feeling that description of feeling is is strongly associated with the aesthetic throughout its history. Uh, we particularly see it in someone, say, like um, Schopenhauer, uh, uh, but the German romantics in general, and uh, even, in, even in Kant, to an extent, this sense of being lost. So those are the features of the sublime as an experience for Shaftesbury. And the outcome of this uh, experience this sublime state when it's perfected, according to Shaftesbury, is not merely just the uh, experience itself, a, a kind of uh, pleasure of, of beauty, perhaps, but a genuine state where we can know the true, the good and the beautiful. So this, again, is appealing to um, the ancient platonic sense of uh, beauty, good and true, having identity or being in close relation, formally related. And for Shaftesbury, they're identical. And the sublime state offers us an experience of that. So we'll experience the true as the knowledge of divine order. So we're directly getting to know God's mind. We understand it as good because the associated passion, the affect is uh, the virtuous affection of enthusiasm. And the object of experience is uh, beauty is is the form is the is the direct form and this is uh, our love of that form so the right the right passion cultivates uh, the right state of being so we're in a loving state uh, about the true things. <laughs> So, so uh, there's parallels to this type of uh, sublime state being one that we come to know. So you might see it in divine illuminations that come out of Augustine or Hildegard, for example. So in a sense, this is coming, uh, this is looking back to those rather than forward to the sublime state being associated with uh, this mixed passion of terrible delight. So that's given us the full sense of what it does right for us, but there are some warnings about this as a practice. So the first one is, and we've heard about it already, is that the false sublime is that it seems like we can mistake the downright raving for the noble enthusiasm. So the problem is that uh, you need to know that you're experiencing the right kind of object. So the cause needs to be right because the effect alone, the feeling feels the same. So it's not sufficient to tell the difference. So just having the feeling might be a problem if we're feeling the false sublime instead of the true. As a broader philosophical practice, Shaftesbury warns us that it can't work on its own because as social beings, 
too much solitude is not a good thing, that he warns that that the sublime experience should not be our only philosophical practice. We shouldn't live our lives alone. We need to be engaged with society and uh, we require others in our day-to-day -day lives. And we also require the other philosophical practices of soliloquy and dialogue. But then at the very end of all this, in the, in the description of Philocles is that, well, then we, don't have enough solitude and I had to put in the full quote because I think it is um, uh, so beautifully written or like conceived uh, that Philocles at the very end of the moralist's worries uh, for as much convinced as I was and as great a convert to Theocles's doctrine my danger still I owe to him um, and I can't actually see, I can't um, see the bits under the faces on my page uh, was very something that I foresaw that when the charm of these places and his company was ceased, I should be apt to relapse and weakly yield to that too powerful charm, the world. And so what uh, Philocles is saying is that like, the way that I can experience enthusiasm where enthusiasm is the right type of moral passion in order to act correctly is when I am in solitude, when I am in the woods, uh, when I am in the company of people who uh, also experience the right type of enthusiasm. And that uh, when I go back to the world, my everyday life, when I step out of this, uh, experience of nature that I'll just relapse into like drinking with those fashionable gents and forget about true enthusiasm and interesting Theocles's response to this is well actually you've still got like the other two um, philosophical practices to engage with so don't worry like like if you're prepared to engage in all of the practices that can help you out here So to give a overview of Philocles' conversion, I've given you a sense of broadly what's going on in the moralists and then the role of the sublime as this particular practice. And then uh, to see how this comes together, the outcome of the moralist is that uh, Philocles' conversion is complete. So by the end, he's uh, convinced by Theocles, his sagacious teacher, uh, to become an, a philosophical enthusiast, and he's had the first types of experiences. He hasn't had a, he hasn't quite developed the full blown uh, sublime experience. He's only observed that and had elements of it. Uh, and there's only so many things you can do in two days, apparently. Uh, but his conversion involves all three elements, importantly. So he has days and uh, two day, at least two days of conversation. And the dialogue isn't just with Theocles. There's guests in the house and there's people at various perspectives and worldviews. And the conversation can get quite heated and controversial. And it's about learning from that, that experience. Then there's guided self-reflection. So when Theocles and uh, Philocles are having conversations, uh, they're designed as practice for soliloquies where instead of having Theocles offer the questions, uh, Philocles would do it in a self-reflective way, not only produce the answers, but produce the questions. And uh, again, that shows us why the moralist is more this guide to philosophical practice and then finally we have this guided contemplation where uh philocles at least gets to see theocles in a in a sublime state where and be talk through what that's like so hopefully uh Describing this sort of broader account of the moralist, which is considered to be uh, 
Shaftesbury's sort of aesthetics uh, text and uh, an origin text for the field of aesthetics in this broader sense and locating the sublime in a as uh, one of these practices that do have these familiar sublime elements, but is also this much more uh, powerful instrument, according to Shaftesbury. Uh, I want to ask us, so, so do we think we should become uh, philosophical enthusiasts too? Uh, and my very bold answer is, Yes, yes, we should. Uh, and I think there's two ways of thinking about how that might work. So I think just as contemporary aestheticians, I think the way that aesthetics is starting to think about itself, uh, particularly with ideas of everyday aesthetics and also challenging uh, the traditional senses of aesthetics in that, uh, is often elitist and, as I uh, alluded to earlier, often uh, implicitly and explicitly sexist, uh, also often senses of being uh, uh, like all of the, if we want to take an intersectional approach, aesthetics often uh, is not very good at considering race, class and gender, sexuality and um, disability. So a lot of the language is, is also quite, quite ableist and, and racist and that type of thing. So uh, to engage, so, so Shaftesbury himself is uh, like nationalistic and uh, deeply sexist. So he considers that women can't have this type of experience. And so I don't mean to suggest to take this uncritically, but if we think of aesthetics as a kind of life practice, rather than the pure judgment of uh, what is aesthetically good, uh, then I think this opens up a really interesting way to, to think about aesthetic experience uh, and engage with that sense of wonder that we engage in the world uh, quite naturally all the time. And then secondly, as a broader philosophical claim, because I'm a historian of philosophy and I like to think about philosophy in a more broad sense, that uh, it's, it's uh, cultivating a love, a, a love for understanding um, and, and that love of wis wisdom. So it, it re-engages with philosophy as, as a sense of uh, love and love of wisdom. So uh, I'm uh, excited and a bit trepidatious about uh, what you might think of that. And I'm, I'd like to have a, some dialogue, some conversation with you. And thank you for this opportunity to uh, share my ideas in a very Shaftesbarian way of having my mind wander all around the place, but hopefully in some semblance of coherence for you. And uh, if you don't have opportunity to talk to me now or would like to talk to me more in the future, you're welcome to contact me on any of the pieces of information at the bottom of your screen. So thank you very much.